Hey, what's up you guys? It's Six. Welcome back to my channel. So today's video is kind of tentatively in celebration of, but also not technically officially in celebration of, because I do have an official video idea started. I Well, it's not started, but... <laughs> This is not the official celebration. I want to do a more dedicated thing here in the future. Um, but it is tentatively in celebration of me hitting 10,000 followers on Instagram, which is super, super cool to me because this is something that I have been trying to reach since I was 17 years old. As a frame of reference, I will be 24 next month. So it it's taken some time. And so I, I it literally is so cool to me that that has finally happened. Um, and the reason that I wanted to hit that number so bad <laughs> was because I really wanted that swipe up feature <laughs> that Instagram no longer has, which is fine. I literally have been using the link button for months thinking that it just was, you know, a, a way for people who didn't have 10,000 followers to be able to include links in their stories. But it's just because the swipe up feature is gone. <laughs> so that's cool. Um, it's still really cool that I hit 10,000 followers. Like that's still a mind blowing number to me, especially because at the beginning of this year I had maybe close to, but not quite 5,000. So I've quite literally doubled my follower count for no reason. <laughs> Why did that happen? It's really cool, um, especially during this period where I have been struggling so much with my art style and just creatively in general with this huge art block and just altogether stress that I have been having about my work. Um, the fact that people are seeing me go through what is quite literally probably one of the most difficult periods I have ever had of my artistic career. The fact that people are seeing me go through that and are like, your art's still rad. I still want to see more of it. I don't care what direction you go in. I'm really enjoying what you're doing is making me crazy <laughs> so i really i really appreciate that and i wanted to do kind of like this q a to kind of chat with you guys a little bit um but then also i do want to do a more in-depth thing in the future i'm leaning towards a couple of different options like a draw this in your style a draw in your ocs video or somebody commented on one of my reels and mentioned me doing maybe like um, this thing where I have finished a drawing and then let you guys finish it, which I think would be super, super cool. And then I would of course do, um, you know, kind of gift art for whatever uh, type of contest uh, that we end up doing. Uh, and I don't, I don't really know how we would do that last one. I don't know if I would do it as kind of like a deviant art base kind of situation where it's like there's no hair or anything like that and you guys all get to decide it or if I just do like line art and then you guys color it and add elements however wherever you want um I definitely need to work out the logistics of that one um, but because I don't have an official um celebration planned yet you guys are super welcome to mention down in the comments below um what you guys want to see me do uh because it will of course be a youtube video because when i do contests like these i really like to have proce uh, process videos available for people who end up winning so that they can see how their piece was made because i just think that you know from a perspective of somebody receiving that i would think that was super cool so uh yeah definitely let me know what you guys want to see i will eventually have a poll up on my community tab for you guys to vote on but again feel free to leave suggestions anyways uh, a bit ago I asked on my Instagram story for you guys to send a few questions in so I am going to answer some of those and then I'm gonna tell y'all a little bit about the drawing that you guys are seeing okay so starting off with our first question we have a very dangerous one and that is what is your favorite animated movie so I'm gonna say that this is a dangerous one because I'm probably gonna end up talking at length about Fullmetal Alchemist probably hopefully not but possibly for the majority of this video so here are some timestamps on screen in case I end up doing that uh, but I have been hyper fixated on Fullmetal Alchemist for the last year I started it in March of last year and it is now March of this year so it has been quite some time that I have been talking about Fullmetal Alchemist every single day to anyone who will listen. And right now that anyone is you, unless you clicked on the timestamps. Anyways, so uh, my favorite animated movie, because I am hyper fixated on FMA, is of course either of the Fullmetal Alchemist movies. So we have Conqueror of Shambhala and the Sacred Star of Milos. So I'm going to start with Conqueror of Shambhala because it is technically, chronologically, the first of the two, um, even though they technically have no relation because the 2003 version, as we all know, is very different to Brotherhood. Brotherhood is a more faithful adaptation of the manga and the original series just did whatever, which I think is awesome. Very strange. Um, it's also really dear to me because it is 
quite literally the fifth anime I ever saw. I can give you guys an exact timeline, so I'm gonna run through that really quick just because I think it's kind of interesting um, that I'm able to pinpoint the exact time that I started watching it. So the first anime I ever saw was Sailor Moon. It was introduced to me as like a five or six year old uh, because a friend would bring it to sleepovers, but because I was so little, uh, I didn't really understand that it was anime and that it was like its own genre of thing. It was just like, that's Sailor Moon cool i like sailor moon uh and then from sailor moon i moved on as a seven-year-old to i stayed up way too late one night and i ended up catching naruto airing on toonami the first episode ever airing on toonami and so uh i was obsessed with it from that i would watch it every single week i would talk about it all the time uh so much so that i wore a naruto headband to school cool um but that led to me making some really cool friends who introduced me to dragon ball z so dragon ball z was similar to sailor moon in that i didn't again understand that it was anime it was just something that my friends who like naruto talk about i would watch amvs every so often um i would watch episodes in passing but i wouldn't seek them out and i wouldn't like I didn't like, again, actively understand this is anime. <laughs> I just was like, that's Dragon Ball Z, cool. Um, Naruto still, however, was my main obsession and I was cosplaying Naruto on Kaya Online at age 10-ish, 10 or 11, uh, and somebody else was cosplaying Hitalia, introduced me to the series, and Hitalia was sort of a jumping off point for me to be like, I really like anime <laughs> because I was old enough to understand that the things that I was really enjoying um, were anime and so i was like i need to watch more and so i sat one down or i sat down one day got on netflix went to the anime section scrolled until something caught my eye and that just so happened to be full metal alchemist <laughs> so uh the 2003 series very interesting very weird but i love it um mainly i think it's superior to brotherhood in one particular way um the well two particular ways but one of them doesn't count because one of them is just that mustang is in it more <laughs> So that doesn't technically count, um, but the main reason that I, I think that I like the 2003 version more is because it captures the characters better, especially when you take into account um, chronologically just the timeline of Edward aging. Um, something I do not like about the Brotherhood series is that Edward does not age. <laughs> like you, you have to rely very narratively on characters saying Edward's 15 now, Edward's uh, 12, Edward's 17, um, versus in the 2003 series, he he you can see him age so for example uh brotherhood he looks the same as he does on the day that he receives his certification as he does on the promise day whereas in the original 2003 series the day that he receives his certification he is so tiny and not just because the joke is like haha he's small haha he's little for his age he's a tiny boy no he looks like a child <laughs> and so him receiving his certification is made more impactful because he's a little boy and you can see that he's a little boy and you can wrap your head around how insane it is that somebody like that can receive their state alchemist certification um and then it makes the thing like with shaw tucker and leor and everything so much more impactful because it's like these horrible things are happening to a little baby <laughs> um versus in brotherhood again he looks the same so those things are made less impactful that's another reason again that i like the conqueror shambhala movie because he looks like an adult he's supposed to be 20 now and he looks 20. he looks like he's grown which i think is super awesome if you look at ed and conqueror shambhala versus ed in the first episode of the 2003 series you can see that he's 20 now which is so cool um and then conqueror shambhala uh, you know art style aside it's just really interesting plot wise it's um <laughs> if you know you know very strange it's very weird but i think it is a befitting end for such a weird series in general so i really like it um i'm not sure how i feel about the ending I'm, I'm a little upset about it um but just you know how it how it uh portrays the characters and all these things except for hughes again if you know you know i love how emo mustang is in it i why is he there why is he doing that for like look at this to him at this point in the movie, he has no idea anybody is coming for him. No idea. So what's with the theatrics? Standing out in the snow like the world's worst popsicle. Like, I literally can't stand him. I hate this man. So Conqueror Shambhala. It's a good movie. It's definitely a curious watch, but it is a good movie. Um, moving on, though, to Sacred Star of Milos. So I, um, it's less fresh in my mind, um, but I do know one thing is for sure. And that is that this movie is uh, literally gorgeous and it is awesome. <laughs> um, I can't remember too much about it other than uh, that it introduces us more to Kreda, which I think is awesome. 
happened because in the series uh, of both Brotherhood and I believe the 2003, but I'm not sure. Um, you know, we kind of hear about more of the places around us, like Drachma, um, and a little bit about Shang. Not too much about Arugo, uh, and then you hear little snippets about Kreta, kind of just like as for fun. Oh, like th this thing is in Kreta, you know, but you don't know anything about the people, anything about anything <laughs> and so the fact that this movie takes place in Kreta, the majority of it um it's really interesting it shows us more world building it shows us you know more about this place that we're in which i think is really really awesome i um, mean i love that they do that but again i can't remember too much about the plot of this movie i think it's something about the philosopher's stone there's like it's something about the philosopher's stone <laughs> i don't remember entirely what uh but i i think it's awesome i think it's gorgeous like look at ed in uh the sacred star of milos versus ed in any of the other series like that looks awesome right like it's so sparkly it's so different um i i think i'm just going off of my memory here right now because i'm literally like sitting in my car recording this voiceover so i can't like google things um but uh from what I remember, Sacred Star of Milos has a lot sharper art style, um, it's very colorful, and it also has a really thick line art in contrast to all three of both Brotherhood, Conqueror of Shambhala, and the original 2003 series. They're very desaturated, very thin line art, very also colored line art on the occasion. Um, a lot of the things like their hair colors and stuff tend to blend into the, um, the you know, the flats of their, their character. So to have the Sacred Star of Milos have this like sharp black outline, everything is so beautiful, it is so pretty. Um, and one thing that I think is criminal about this movie is that Roy is so hot in this movie and he is barely in it. He's so pretty in this movie. It is criminal, criminally criminal that it, it you can't. I, I, li why? Look at him. Look at him. This is, I literally have to defend him sometimes because here he is in the series, the, the all three of the other ones on a, on an, an, on an average basis. And then here he is in Sacred Star of Milos. That is a beautiful man. A beautiful man. Will he wear wigs? I don't know. But he is so cute. He is so cute in that movie. Why isn't he in it more? Um, so anyway, <laughs> that is pretty much it for uh, that question. I rambled so long about it. I am so sorry. Uh, but I really love it. Also, technically a real answer uh, for like just nostalgia based like movies that aren't related to my current hyper fixation. Um, probably any of the older Disney or Don Bluth movies, if I had to give two, I would say The Secret of Nim and Robin Hood. Uh, but <laughs> the, the that those don't have Roy Mustang in them. So th yeah, they're definitely lower down on the list. Anyways, next question. Okay, so her chaotic full metal alchemist rambling aside, how was the process of starting an Etsy shop? Did you have any insecurities or problems and how did you manage it? So technically this all started, or my Etsy shop rather, all started because I had a ton of leftover prints that did not sell at a convention that I wanted to find a way to get rid of. So technically my, uh, my Etsy shop was started from insecurity because I was super insecure about the fact that these prints did not sell. And so I put them on Etsy hoping that they would sell there and they didn't. Um, I sold maybe four of them and I had 10 of each design and maybe five designs. So that was about 50 prints that I sold four of and one that I sold at the convention that they were brought to. So something that you have to keep in mind when selling on a marketplace like Etsy as opposed to your own shop is that you are competing with everyone on Etsy. So please try not to get discouraged uh, when things don't sell because at some point it is going to happen. I mean, I really hope that your first shop launch is super successful and you have a ton of people buying whatever it is that you're trying to put up. Um, but uh, as, as far as managing problems and insecurity and stuff goes, keep in mind uh, that that you are going to have times where you put your heart and soul into a piece um, and maybe people are hyping you up and saying that they want to buy prints of it and then you put that print up and it doesn't sell. Uh, and it, it has nothing to do with whether or not people like your art. I promise people like your work. Um, if your stuff doesn't sell, it's more so because of something called SEO or search engine optimization. So uh, SEO is difficult, especially if you are a smaller creator and have less search traffic for people who are searching for you in particular. Um, uh, for example, take my space punk print. So I really love my space punk print. I think it's super cool. Um, I really like the art. <laughs> I was really proud of it. I had people telling me up and down that they wanted to buy prints of it when it went up. Uh, and then I launched it and nobody bought it <laughs> the first day. I think I've only sold uh, two of them in total, at least uh, on Etsy anyway. Um, 
so uh, I I was super excited about it and I had all these people telling me that they were gonna get it and then they didn't uh, and that's okay and then as it sat you know I only had those two sales from people who were originally saying I want to buy prints of it when I put it up uh, and I haven't had any like Etsy traffic push people towards that and have them buy it that way and that is because if you search like space punk or monster girl print on etsy uh i'm probably not going to show up in one of the first pages it probably definitely i'm going to be deeper down in there and if somebody is in one of the first pages and sees something that they like in those first pages that that's what they're going to buy they're not going to get they're not going to dig you know, 10 pages deep into Etsy, if they already found something that they like, they're going to buy the thing that they already saw and already liked. So it's not because my art is bad. It's just because my SEO is not great. Uh, and so that's something that you have to keep in mind is, um, that feeling of <laughs> discouragement, uh, is, is definitely going to come up and you just have to remind yourself it is not a reflection of your work and it is purely a reflection on, um, of algorithms and things like that. Um, so one tip that I would say is to, uh, when you're smaller, try to rely less on SEO and more so on building an audience of people who will enjoy your work because you're more likely to get sales from people who know you personally and are familiar with uh, with your work as opposed to people who will stumble on your work through the search, fun uh, search function. Um, although those are still good things to keep in mind, you know, still want to do things like tags and all of that. Um, but again, just keep in mind, try to focus more on finding people who like your work as opposed to hoping people stumble upon it. Um, mainly, uh, I would just try to stay positive, uh, try to take really good photos if you can, uh, also take videos, Etsy really likes videos, um, and make sure you're letting people know about your shop. So for example, check out my shop. All of my stickers are currently 75% off. The link is on screen here and down in the description. Um, and I really like them. I think they're super cute. Um, so yeah, try to do stuff like that. <laughs> just try to show people you have a shop, this is your work. People like you. People like your work. So they'll go to your shop if they can. Um, but again, just keep in mind that sometimes you're not going to make sales and that's okay. Uh, I would also highly recommend if you have the opportunity uh, to create your own website as opposed to um, starting an Etsy shop. I know that's hypocritical because I don't have my own website. I can't afford my own website right now. So I stick with Etsy uh, because it is, it is really accessible. But if you can make your own website, it is super, super helpful because then it, it takes some of that competition out. People are going to your website because it's just you there. It's just you and your work. They can only find your work on there. So you're definitely more likely uh, to make sales that way as opposed to, again, competing with all of these other people. So yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I hope that helps. I hope that makes sense. Uh, I'm, I'm still figuring all of that stuff out myself. But anyway, next question. Okay, so this next question that we have is one that I get pretty often, and that is, how did you find your art style? So if I have not already made a video on this, then I really need to, but for now, to put it shortly and simply, look at other artists around you and see what you like about their style. Uh, take that and do style studies. So find out what techniques work naturally for you that you can incorporate into your own style, or maybe ones that you haven't quite nailed that really interest you and keep studying them. And for example, when I say do a style study, uh, I mean like take a piece and try to recreate that piece the same way you would an old master uh, if you've you know ever taken an art class you'll find they make you do this grid thing and you have to study you know old master works you don't have to do a grid but you can if it helps um, but uh, yeah try to uh, recreate that illustration yourself and then again like I said uh, take into account what techniques work naturally for you when you're recreating that see if you can incorporate that in your own work uh, or if there's something that you're having trouble with but you really like the look of keep trying that and then do this with multiple artists and eventually your style will start to emerge because it will become a combination of all of your other interests and it will have your own unique flourish to create something that is new and that is you um, for example I've talked before about how my art style uh, the techniques and things that I do are mostly just me um, kind of picking certain things from certain artists that I like to do. Uh, so for example, uh, the way that I render is really inspired by um, Sarah Tepez and Kiwi Bird and a couple of other artists. Um, and then it kind of combines into me because I, I do different things and I'm like, okay, they do that this way. And I like that. I like how it looks, but here's how I do it. That makes it look a little bit different and is more unique to me. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, I definitely, if I have not already, will make a more in-depth video about that soon. 
Okay, so kind of touching on that last topic, we have the question, where does your biggest art inspiration come from? And this is such a difficult question for me at the moment because I have been absolutely struggling with my art style as of late. I have been super insecure about it. Um, I'm also seeing all sorts of different styles that influence me, even if they're drastically different. Uh, like for example, Frannard and Cheyenne Barton's kind of classic Western cartoon, uh, cartoonish, very shapely style. But then on the other hand, really gorgeous painterly pieces from Sarah Tepes and Kelsey Beckett that are more like soft and like fantasy-like illustrations kind of leaning towards more like semi-realism uh, and I was also really inspired by Loish when I was younger and I still do really enjoy her work I just don't see it as often uh, but it's definitely still something that inspires me so yeah it's kind of tough to say really uh, but those are some artists that I really enjoy at the very least Next question is, what is your favorite piece from this year? So initially, I thought that this was going to be a hard question because I haven't made a lot of art this year for myself anyway. Um, and also, I've been really not proud of anything that I make lately. Uh, but then I remembered this Dracula piece and I still love and adore it so much. You can also find her as a print on my shelf that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I'm super, super proud of it. And it was also one of those illustrations where I kind of had to try something new, I, whether it was intentionally or accidentally with the rendering because it was done traditionally. Um, and it completely altered my art style, not drastically or anything like that, but I think working on this piece really upped my shading game. Uh, I used to not shade that little spot between the eyebrows and on the bridge of the nose. And the way that I would usually shade the cheeks was a little bit different with this drawing as well. Um, and I've since picked up doing that on purpose and I love it so much. I think it definitely helped improve uh, my work in general. I love when I work on a piece and I, you know, I try something. For example, it's, it's been happening a lot uh, this last year, uh, especially with working on commissions. Um, I remember I was working uh, on a commission a few months back and I was shading the nose and I was like, this doesn't have enough definition or something. And then I did one darker line um, on the shadow of the nose. So it was like, I usually have two shadow colors. So I have a mid shadow and then I have a deeper shadow. And I put the deeper shadow just along the edge where uh, the medium shadow touches the actual um, highlight, I guess, or the base of the face. Uh, and I was like, oh my God that's really cool uh, i was doing it because it didn't have enough contrast but then i was like that's awesome i'm gonna start doing that on purpose and i did um so that really changed the way that i did that and then a few years back i was making a commission sheet and i decided to shade the corners of the mouth which is something that i had never done until that day and now i do it on every single piece because it looks adorable um so yeah i really love um you know getting to those pieces that kind of uh you know you work on them and then they alter your style so those tend to uh stick in my mind more because they they brought some change in a good way so yeah definitely draculaura i also just really love her colors and draculaura in general she's super cute i'm working on a draculaura repaint right now which is super cool i've never done that before i'm terrified i'm really mad too because i started um I put a uh, tester's spray lacquer on her because somebody told me that it was the same thing as the dual coat, which is, I think, not true because now she's glossy and she wasn't supposed to be, <laughs> but I think it's fine because her head matches her body and she's not super, super shiny. Um, but yeah, I don't know if it's going to work right. <laughs> I've never done this before. I did not have Mr. Super Clear. It is not accessible to me where I am without ordering it online and waiting forever. And I wanted to start it. So yeah, really love Draculaura. Really love this piece. Go check out the prints on my shop if you are able to. All right, so moving to our final question before we start talking about the illustration. So you've been working a while. How many times have you had a brand identity crisis? And this is such a fitting question, my guy. The answer is always, 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 even since rebranding. Um, initially, when I first made my name back in 2017, I thought that it was awesome. It's super interesting. Uh, by the way, if you're new to the channel, it used to be Simon AES Arts all together all one word i thought it was awesome super unique and memorable <laughs> and maybe it was but after a year or so of starting my instagram i started to feel like it wasn't uh and i started wanting to change it but then i got paranoid because would people remember me if i changed my name especially uh a few months later because that is when i started to or not months later i think it was uh, like two or three years in especially is when i started really kind of 
thinking about that but then I was like if I change now that I I think I had like a thousand subscribers um and like a couple thousand on Instagram I was like people are starting to notice me if I change my name are they gonna forget about me um you know it, is is that gonna be bad if I do that um and I still felt like that but I pushed it down because of that fear uh and then after a few more years I started to see other people with really easy to say really professional sounding memorable names and I finally was like nope I need a change um and even now after rebranding i still second guess myself because sure my name is more memorable but at the same time i don't have the same name on every platform anymore so that strikes a little bit of insecurity in me um and on top of that if i see someone with a really short silly and funky little mascot or a short name and funky mascot i'm like why why don't i do that that's so cool like a lot of people just have like a noun and then a silly little mascot and i'm like that's awesome why, why didn't i do that I had the chance to rebrand. I should have done that. But then I was like, no, I can have a mascot if I want. It doesn't require a third rebrand. I don't need to do that. I'm just insecure about my work and my presence right now. Uh, so again, the answer is that I am always having a brand identity crisis, but the best way to get out of it is to just kind of figure out what you like about how other people represent themselves and think about how that relates to you, um, kind of like your art style, <laughs> and get comfortable with the near constant want to change and figuring out how to talk yourself into being comfortable with yourself again, because it's gonna happen a lot. I hope that makes sense. I hope it's helpful. Um, basically, cope. <laughs> uh, if you want to rebrand and you've thought about it for a very long time, like I had, just do it. <laughs> just do it. I mean, people didn't immediately forget about me because I changed my name. So, yeah, definitely um, do it if you want to. If you're second guessing yourself and you've been second guessing yourself for years, uh, kind of do that last bit. Kind of think about how you want to change. Really think for a long time about it. Don't just impulsively change everything like I did because I definitely regretted it um, at the very beginning. Uh, but yeah, definitely give it some thought. Uh, but if you want to, you should absolutely do it. You should absolutely uh, be proud of how you're representing yourself. And if you're not, then that's definitely a surefire way to uh, ensure that you will not succeed because you're not going to be happy with sharing people uh, or showing people your work or your platform or whatever so definitely rebrand if you want to um and if you don't just kind of you know talk to yourself and be like why don't i like it and kind of figure out if you know if you have to rebrand to alter that or if you just need to do some self-reflection and see if it's maybe how you carry yourself or something like that i hope that helps i hope that makes sense <laughs> Okay, so finishing off this video onto the illustration. So I'm gonna keep this short and sweet. This is literally just a painting of Vampire Cookie because I love Cookie Run Kingdom. It is the only thing that cuts through my Full Metal Alchemist brain rot, almost. We'll get to that. Uh, it is a game that my partner has been playing for about a year uh, that I was always convinced was way too complicated for me to play because gacha games with more than one event going on at once drive me absolutely nuts trying to remember everything that you're supposed to do uh, but Cookie Run Kingdom is not like that. <laughs> I watched him play at length one day and saw just how easy it was to navigate the menus and this is not a sponsor by the way but if Cookie Run Kingdom wants to sponsor me <laughs> I will do it! <laughs> Anyways, I saw how easy it was to navigate the menus and I was like, no, I could do that. Because the thing is, <laughs> from watching and listening to him play, I was already attached to all of the characters and their designs and some of the lore because some parts he refused to tell me in case I started playing. Uh, so once I saw that it wasn't that complicated, I picked it up and haven't put it down since. In fact, it's 10 a.m., which means it's a new day. I need to do my dailies. Uh, but anyway, also, if you want to be homies on Cookie One Kingdom, uh, I'm on the Dark Cacao server. Go to friends and add a new Amestris, uh, which I see how it, it doesn't quite cut through that brain rot. Somebody has a mistress and somebody else has full metal and I want full metal so bad. They haven't played in a year. If you're full metal and you're watching this video, give me full metal, please. <laughs> Anyways, um, it's new Amestris, as you see on screen here, capital N, capital A, no space. Uh, don't make fun of my kingdom though, because she's not decorated. <laughs> I'm just trying to get expansions, and they keep forcing me to construct these giant factories, but I'm going to do whatever it takes, because I'm grinding right now. I need to get to world 10 before next week so I can finish the Stardust event. I literally, I'm never going to get Stardust Cookie. Every time I pull him, it's all soul stones. I'm so mad. One time I thought I was going to get him. 
because it was like the little epic sparkle because the 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 gotchas they do different things <laughs> when you're pulling for cookies so you can kind of tell if you're gonna get um you know if you're gonna get all common cookies or soul stones or if you're gonna get a rare epic or uh, legendary character so i thought i was gonna get uh i thought i was gonna get stardust cookie and then it was dark choco cookie which is fine i wanted dark choco cookie but I wanted Stardust Cookie more. Anyways, uh, <laughs> the actual illustration, like I said, is just Vampire Cookie because I was having major brain rot and also art block and Vampire Cookie is easy to draw and also easily one of my favorite cookies. He reminds me so much of Cassidy from Preacher, uh, which as you guys know, was one of my previous hyperfixations. Uh, so enthusiastically, one of my favorite cookies. So much so that I almost dropped the F-bomb there when I was writing this script. I really like vampire cookie so yeah uh, I love him this was kind of a messy illustration because I was having a pretty bad art day this day not necessarily in that uh, what I produced looked bad uh, but more so just generally having difficulty making art which can really suck sometimes when art is your job uh, so I didn't do any like clean line art or anything uh, and went kind of messy with the painting and shading but I still think it looks pretty good at the very least I love how the colors turned out and you can definitely tell if you're a CRK player that this is Vampire Cookie. I hope, I hope you can tell it's a Vampire Cookie. He's a comedically small juice glass, but I think it's hilarious how tiny it is. I was not preparing for the size. I don't even think I gave him a hand in the original sketch because it was um, it was part of a sketchbook sheet that had a bunch of other characters on it. By a bunch of other characters, I mean Ed. <laughs> so I've been drawing so many Eds lately. It's one of the only things I can get myself to draw, which is why it has been so hard uh, for me to come up with YouTube videos lately because my brain is just like Full Metal Alchemist only. Can't make any other art. But anyway, that is it for this video, you guys. I know it was super chaotic. I hope you enjoyed. Please Please, please, please leave recommendations down in the comments for, um, you know, things that you want to see for the 10k subscriber, um, you know, celebration thing. Um, I also last minute decided that I'm going to do a, an emoji challenge thing. So definitely check out my Instagram stories uh, or, you know, leave some emojis in the comments down below for me to try to make characters of. I don't know when that video is going to come out. It's totally unrelated to the 10k celebration thing. It's just something that I want to do. So uh, if you want to see that, leave a comment down below. I love you guys so, so much and I'll see y'all in the next one. Bye.